God, you have allowed us to awaken this morning, and you have uh, motivated us to uh, get up and get ready to, uh, to make the journey to this place. Others you have uh, allowed to uh, join us uh, online or um, through TV. God, we're thankful. And we gather here with each other. And we expect you to meet us in this place. And you know, and we know that you're here. You have heard our voices lifted in praise. We have offered our prayers to you. And we will offer yet other prayers uh, throughout the day. We know that you hear. The words of Scripture have been read. And God, you speak to us. Now, God, I pray that you will allow a word to be spoken. A word that... Uh, you have directed, that you have inspired. And I pray that the words of my mouth and that the words that uh, your people will hear will be pleasing and acceptable, will cause us to grow, will edify and encourage This is our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. There is a, um, there's a gentleman, his name is uh, Bill Bishop. And uh, the name may not mean anything to any of you. Bill Bishop is a, he's a journalist. And uh, he writes most, most frequently, uh, his, his articles can be found uh, in newspapers, he's he, uh, a frequent contributor to, contributor to uh, the Austin American uh, down in, in Austin, Texas. He also contributes uh, to the Lexington Herald. He contributes to uh, the Bastrop County Times. Uh, he's, he's also written uh, some books, and one of the books uh, that Bill Bishop has written, uh, came out several years ago, is called, it's titled, The Big Sort. S-O-R-T, the big sort. And uh, the subtitle is, is Why the Clustering of Like-Minded America is Tearing Us Apart. And in this book, um, Bill Bishop uh, argues that America has been, as America has become uh, increasingly mobile, we have for a number of reasons, for a whole, a whole list of reasons, uh, we have clustered together uh, with, with people that are like us, people that, uh, that, that think like us, people that, uh, that are like us socially and culturally, um, and, and, um, and economically. And, and he says, and I quote, we have built a country where everyone can choose the neighbors most compatible with his or her lifestyle and beliefs. He goes on to say, over time, this means that people in these homogenous communities are ever and ever less exposed to views different from their own. And the danger in this, uh, Bishop argues, as communities, as groups of people and communities become uh, more ideologically similar, members of those groups and, community, and communities tend to grow more extreme and intolerant of differing or contrary opinions. I don't know. Um, it's certainly true that, that we, that we uh, 
uh, choose to live in uh, neighborhoods uh, very often with people like us, people uh, in, in similar places uh, socially, uh, uh, people in similar uh, places as we are economically. But I don't know if I would completely agree with Mr. Bishop's argument that clustering, and that's his word, not mine, I don't know if I completely buy into his argument that clustering into communities with other, other like-minded folks is the reason that we're being torn apart. But it's certainly true, it's certainly true that... Um, that divisiveness and polarization uh, in our country has gone to seed. I don't think anybody could argue that it has not. We see it in all areas of life. We even see it in the church. We gather, we gather together each week in places like this with, with, with people who are like us in many, many ways, with people who are like us uh, for the most part. They look like us, they, they, they think like us, they live like us, they believe like us. Yet even, even here in the church, and, and we here at Epworth, we United Methodists can, can attest to this. Even we at, at Epworth can attest to the divisiveness and the polarization and the contentiousness that has wormed its way into us. It seems that people have always always found things over which to disagree and to fight about. That's, that, that's part of, of our human nature. One of the, one of the, uh, one of the uh, preachers and theologians whom, uh, who has been uh, most influential for me, I've never met uh, Tom uh, personally, but I, I, uh, I read a lot of, of his of his stuff. His name's Tom Long, and uh, Reverend Doctor Tom Long is professor emeritus of preaching at Candler School of Theology. Tom Long has a theory uh, about why that happens, even in church. And to boil it all down, <laughs> Doctor Long says it's God's fault. Listen to what, what he says. No matter how strenuously we try to keep our pews filled with folks just like ourselves, God keeps sending people who disrupt the norm. God keeps sending people whose very presence provokes a rethinking of who we are and what we are about. God keeps sending folks to us in the church that aren't like us and that challenge us. It's God's fault. Jesus was like that. Jesus was, was, that, was that, that provocation in his time. Shows up in the religious community and things go sideways. It was like that in uh, the passage we read out of, of Mark's gospel this morning. Jesus was like that. The disciples were like that. Paul was like that. Throughout history, leaders of the church have been like that. Throughout history, lay people have been uh, sources uh, through which God has provoked and disrupted 
and challenge the church to rethink. It seems it has always been that way. In our passage this morning, Jesus is at uh, the synagogue, uh, the assembly of faithful people in a community where many of the faithful uh, were very much alike. And it's, at, it, it's on the Sabbath day. And the people have gathered to do the things they do in the synagogue on the Sabbath. And a man with a shriveled hand or an arthritic hand or a crippled hand, we don't know uh, exactly what the condition was other than, other than to say that Mark says it was, was, uh, was uh, a withered. It was mangled. Somehow uh, his hand was not right. And he was different. And he was in need. And he was there. And Jesus was there too. And the religious, the religious norms, the practices, the things that identified that, that they did in that place that, that identified them, all of that was disrupted. And everything that these good and pious and faithful and God-worshipping people were about was provoked. Everyone knew the rules. Everyone knew the law handed down from Moses. If they didn't know all 613, they certainly knew the Big Ten. We know the Big Ten, even if we can't recite them verbatim, no God but God. No other God but God. Honor your parents. Don't murder. Don't steal. Don't play hanky-panky with your neighbor's spouse. You remember those, right? If, if, you want to, if you want to check them out, if you want a refresher, go back to the Old Testament book of Exodus, chapter 20. Just so you know, I went back this week and reread them for myself. Rule number four of the Big Ten has to do with the Sabbath. It says, keep it holy. Don't do anything, but keep it holy. Pretty clear, right? Pretty clear. Except there are a couple of little things that complicate it for us. A couple of little things like context and interpretation. Now, when, 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 when people like me go to preacher school, uh, there's a word for that. It's called hermeneutics. It's the study of how we interpret written things, in our case, Scripture. Jesus is doing some hermeneutics with the folk at synagogue that day. Jesus is setting the context. He's interpreting. Number four. It's been, it's been said, I've read this, and I forget uh, where I read this. I apologize. I can't, I can't, give, I can't give a reference. But, but I, I've read uh, that it's been said... Uh, the, of the relationship between law and gospel, law and good news, 
um, the, the, the good news embodied and taught by Jesus, that we need to remember that in Exodus, chapter 19 comes before chapter 20. And you may be saying, what? See, the only Bible that Jesus had, the only Bible that anybody in that time had, was what we call the Old Testament. And in the Old Testament, in the book of, of Exodus, both then and now, you'll be surprised, maybe you'll be surprised, maybe you won't, to, to learn that, that chapter 19 does, in fact, come before chapter 20. And in chapter 19, if you go back and read in chapter 19, uh, early in chapter 19, uh, beginning about verse 4, you read something that might sound like this. God speaking and says, I bore you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. You, people, are my most important possession. You know what that is? Is that, is that a statement of law? That's a statement of relationship. You see what God's doing here? Before there was ever the law, God establishes the relationship. Relationship for God has always Always, always come first. It, it, is, it is literally primary. If we go all the way back to the beginning of Genesis. God uses relational language when we are created. God says, let us create Humankind in our image. And we go on to read, we read that God had and established a relationship with humans. God establishes a, a relationship with us. And only then, only after the relationship has been established, does God ever uh, claim, uh, make any kind of a claim on our demand on our behavior. So then if, if, if law is not primary, then law cannot ever earn our salvation. Salvation, you see, is through a relationship, in particular, a relationship with Jesus Christ, and as Christians, we, we, we believe that that, serving, that, 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 that that saving relationship is only with Jesus Christ. But that's not all. Since the law can't save us, neither is it about us. Here's what I mean. The law, look, the law does not give us, the law does not give you or me um, it's not given to you or me in order to make us a better me or you. The Ten Commandments is given not to make you a better you. The Ten Commandments is the law about our neighbor. Go home and read them. God does not give us the law so that I can be more spiritual or, or that you can live your best life now. 
God gives the law, the commandments, the big 10, so that our neighbors can have his or her best life now. And, and that is so important uh, for Jesus that, that he, he summed it up for us. And I shared it with the kids just a little bit ago. What are the two most important commandments? Love God with everything that we are and love our neighbors as ourselves. And our neighbors, according to Jesus, is everyone. 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 Love your neighbor as yourself. Love God. No other commandment, no other law, no other rule is greater than these. Everything that the Ten Commandments speaks of is about this relationship. Don't bear false witness against who? Your neighbor. Don't covet. Don't covet what? Your neighbor's stuff. Don't murder or steal or commit adultery. It doesn't say neighbor in there anywhere, but it's implied. It's, it's understood. Honor your father and your mother. Honor your parents. They're our parents, but they're still our neighbor. The law is set up because God loves them, loves them so much that we're, not, that we're told not to do anything that would harm them. And the same goes for us. For Jesus, in the synagogue that day, the disagreement or, or the confrontation about what to do with this man and his hand is all about this neighborly uh, relationship. Is it lawful to help this guy out? What's the most loving thing to do? That, that is, it, 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 it's not even a question of is it lawful for Jesus because that is always, always the thing to do. It's always the right thing to do. And I think what Jesus is saying here in these early pages of Mark's gospel is, is, that, is that both, both relationship and law are important. Jesus is not throwing the law out. He's, he's setting the context for us. He's helping us to, to understand him in, in the right framework. I also think Jesus knows how extremely difficult it is for us to, uh, to embody this, for us to enact this uh, care, this neighborly love and care for those uh, people that are, are, are different than us. I think, I think he knows how difficult it is for us to love our neighbors. He knows because all we have to do is look at the kind of, of the opposition that he faced during his earthly ministry. Every step of the way. And yet, and yet he continues uh, throughout his ministry to demonstrate uh, what it looks like for us to love our neighbor. He, he, he goes to all kinds of folk, all, all kinds of, of unwelcome, unwanted, unaccepted uh, people, and he welcomes them, and he invites them, and he eats with them, and he feeds them, and he heals them, and he touches them, and he embraces them, and he welcomes them to himself, and, and he nurtures them, and he restores them to a relationship with each other, with their communities, with their family, and with God. And he does this without ever wavering from it, even as it leads him to the cross. I 
And along the way, during all this welcoming and feeding and healing and restoring and being loving and neighborly to everyone along the way, Jesus constantly, constantly invites all people who would follow him to do the same. And his message, his, his promise, his, the, 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 the good news, the good news is that at the resurrection, all who do this will triumph. And we still got to wrestle with what that means. But we'll triumph. That in the end, love is stronger than fear or hate or even death. That love, that love is even stronger than our desire to do anything that gives the illusion, even though it's a false illusion, it's still an illusion, doing anything that gives us the illusion of safety that we convinced ourselves is provided by doctrine and law. Folks, we have been invited into a deep and a loving relationship with God through Jesus Christ. We know that already. We are called to put that love to use for our neighbor. And our neighbor is everyone. And that's a challenge for us. I know. And sometimes, look, sometimes we're going to stumble and fail at this. But sometimes, sometimes we're going to get it right. Sometimes we're going to succeed at this. But regardless of whether when we find ourselves having failed or, or having uh, been successful in this, always, always, always the risen Christ is there. Jesus is there forgiving us when we falter, affirming us and encouraging us when we get it right, always beckoning, beckoning us forward always encouraging us uh, to, do, to take the next step, always loving us along the way so that we might always love. The good news, my friends, the good news is that 19 comes before 20. Relationships come before the law because at the heart of the law, Above the law, there has always, always been love. And divine love, divine love redeems all. And this is for you and it's for me. And it's a word that everyone needs to hear. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit.